All right, good morning once again. Uh, if you would open in your Bible to the book of 1 Samuel, and this morning we're going to be in chapter 18, uh, verses 1 to 11. The title of the sermon this morning is Jealousy, Comparison, and the Praise of Man. So let's read the text, open us in a word of prayer, and uh, we will jump into the sermon this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, if you'll follow along in your copy of God's word. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they've only ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul. And he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand. Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. We'll stop right there. Let's pray. God, I pray, um, as we look at this text, that you continue to teach us, Lord, by this tragic example of King Saul... Um, and also this righteous example of of David and how he responded to King Saul. Um, God, what a tragedy uh, King Saul's life is. And and I pray, God, that you help us to be warned by it, that we too would not make the same mistakes that he did, and that we would be encouraged that his story is not our story, And that through the Holy Spirit and by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we can conquer sin in a way that Saul was unwilling, unable to. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, One of my all-time favorite movie quotes is from a football movie. Uh, The coach is driving home uh, with his quarterback, and the quarterback is explaining to the coach that he feels like he's cursed. That no matter what he does, he can't win. He's going to lose. And the coach says to him this, well, it took me a long time to realize it, but there ain't much difference between winning and losing, except for how the outside world treats you. But inside you, it's all about the same. There ain't much difference between winning and losing inside of you. What makes the difference is how the outside world treats you. You see it on a kid's playground, don't you? Two kids can be playing one-on-one. They can completely be enjoying playing each other. No rivalry, no competition, no attitudes. But now put an audience, an audience who cheers and compares and comments. And now all of a sudden it matters. Why? Jealousy, comparison, and the praise of man. That's what the sermon is about this morning. So let's look at our text. We'll go through it verse by verse, and then I'll give application at the end of it. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, let's look at verse 1 here. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit 
to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, in our context here, David has just killed the Philistine giant, Goliath. And Saul had promised three rewards. He said he would give riches, he would give his daughter in marriage, and he would make the man who killed Goliath, his family, free, meaning free from taxes, probably. But David got one more reward, the friendship of Jonathan. If you remember, Jonathan is Saul's eldest son. We first saw him in 1 Samuel 13 to 14. It was clear from that story that we looked at that Jonathan was the king that Israel needed. He was a far better man than his father was. However, when Saul disobeyed God, not only was his kingship rejected, but so was Jonathan's. Even though Jonathan will never be king, he unites himself with the future king of Israel. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. I think that's their way of saying they became best friends. Jonathan loved him as his own soul, and David loved him likewise. In 2 Samuel 1, after Jonathan dies, David writes this, Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. That's a serious friendship right there. Verse 2, And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Now, if you remember, Saul had previously summoned David to play the liar for him. The reason for that is that this evil spirit is tormenting him. And whenever David would play the liar, it would make the evil spirit go away. David also is Saul's armor bearer. But David did not permanently stay with Saul. Saul would allow him to go back and forth to his dad in Bethlehem to feed the sheep. He's a shepherd. But now Saul has taken David and has permanently kind of moved him into the king's quarters. Um, is that a sign of affection? A sign of, is it a strategy? Is it a suspicion? Well, we shall see. Let's look at verse 3 to 4. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him, and gave it to David and his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. Now, Jonathan makes this covenant. We're given no specifics of this covenant. I assume it meant that Jonathan is essentially stating that he is for David. He's on David's side. Normally, when you make a covenant, you exchange some form of a, a sign or a seal of that covenant. Just like uh, when you get married, you exchange a wedding ring. This is a, a sign or a seal of the covenant that I made with my wife. So Jonathan gives to David his robe, his armor, his sword, his bow, and his belt. It's almost as if Jonathan is transferring all of the symbolic symbols of being a prince and giving them to David. Jonathan is stating that he will not be in competition with David. He is for David. Let's look at verse 5. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in all the sight of the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now David is successful wherever Saul set, sent him. Now, David's success, though, is not owing to his own achievements. It is owing to the three previous statements that were said about him. Number one, he's a man after God's own heart. Number two, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And number three, the Lord was with him. And therefore, David has success wherever he goes. Now, since he has success wherever he goes, Saul capitalizes on this success. And he puts David in charge of the men of war. And of course, this was good in the sight of the people. It was pleasing in the sight of the people. And as well as Saul's servants, probably better translated officers and soldiers. I mean, surely you, you know, if you got a, a soldier who's successful wherever he goes, you want him on your side. You want him leading your battalion. Now consider this. You have a soldier in your army who has killed the Philistine giant. He has success wherever he goes. If you are a wise king, 
This is a tremendous blessing. Tremendous blessing. But as we will see, it's not enough for Saul. Look at verse 6 and 7. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. So as they're coming home after killing Goliath, the women come out from their homes They line up like a parade and they're singing and they're dancing. And you notice who they came out to meet? They came out to meet King Saul. They have tambourines. They have various musical instruments. They're singing songs of joy. They're celebrating in Israel's victory. And here are the lyrics of one of the songs that they sang to one another. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. Oh boy. There ain't much difference between winning and losing except how the outside world treats you. This song is going to become famous. It's going to trend not only in Israel, but also Philistia. In 1 Samuel 21, 10 to 11, they say, Is this not David, the, the king of the land? Do they not sing to one another of him and dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his tens of thousands. This song made it all the way to Philistia. Now, how is Saul going to respond to David's newfound popularity. Look at verse 8. And Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they've only ascribed thousands. What, What more can he have but the kingdom? Saul is very angry. This saying displeased him. That that phrase displeased him literally translates as was evil in his eyes. This saying was evil in his eyes. Now, why was Saul so angry? Why was he so angry? Because he stood in a bog called comparison. Now keep in mind, Saul is still the king. He still enjoys all the accolades of being king. But he says, what more can he have but the kingdom? Now what does that statement reveal about Saul? I'll tell you what it reveals. It reveals that Saul's kingship was not about the Lord. And it wasn't about the people. It was about himself. A king or a president or a prime minister or a governor exists for the people. And in this case, in a theocracy, he exists for God first and then the people. But for Saul, his kingship was about himself. Now, how do I get that from Saul's statement? Because in Saul's mind, what made him a king was what people thought about him. His own popularity. His own legacy. Saul is saying, well listen, I'm the king. I'm the king. But David has all this praise. David has all this popularity. Well, he might as well have the kingdom. Is that what being king is about, Saul? Is that what being king is about? Is, being, is, is not being king about serving the Lord? Is not being king about serving the people? Is this about your legacy, your popularity? What people think about you? Verse 9. 
And Saul eyed David from that day on. Saul eyed, that's an interesting phrase, he eyed David. Uh, what does that mean? The Hebrew word for eyed is literally sin or transgression. It's a noun. It's a noun here, which doesn't make any sense because a verb should be used here. The Septuagint does use a verb, and the verb that they use in the Septuagint, uh, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, means to look suspiciously at. To look suspiciously at. So Saul begins to look with suspicion on David. Now notice what the narrator says. He eyes David, meaning he looks suspiciously at David from that day on. The king becomes a slave to his own jealousy. Verse 10a. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Now, we have discussed this before. I know that some of you may not have been here on the previous sermon for this. So let me just briefly recap here um, uh, what's going on here. The word for harmful here is literally evil, an evil spirit. Uh, it's possible that this is the same thing as a demon in the New Testament, though not necessarily. We have to be sure that we read an implied scent here, that an evil spirit was sent from the Lord, that God has control over all things, including evil spirits, and God sends this evil spirit to come upon Saul to do his will. Now, previously, the evil spirit tormented Saul. If you remember when we looked at that, it's literally terrified Saul. And the, the, the Septuagint uses a word that means strangled. So I think the idea is that the spirit strangled Saul with fear and paranoia. But here we see it has a somewhat different effect. So three more questions arise from this passage with this evil spirit. Number one, why did God send the harmful spirit now? Why now? If you remember from the previous example, I said that I think God sends this evil spirit as a form of judgment a form of judgment upon Saul. And I think we see the same thing here. Saul is angry. He thinks that David's praise is evil in his eyes. Now, forgetting that it was not David who struck down Goliath. It was the Lord who struck down Goliath, ultimately. He wallows in jealousy and suspicion. And as a result, the next day, God sends this evil spirit. I think God is responding to Saul's heart and is judging it by sending this evil spirit. Number two, why did God send it while David was playing the lyre? Now, previously, remember, we looked at the narrator said, whenever the harmful spirit from God would come upon Saul, David took the lyre, he played it, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So why didn't it work here? Was David just not hitting the notes right? This shows us that David's playing was not ultimate. God's word is. God tells the evil spirit when to rush upon Saul. And God tells the evil spirit when to depart from Saul. David was just an instrument in God's hand. Three, what does it mean that Saul raved? What does that word raved mean? The word for raved is used 114 times in the Old Testament. 112 out of the 114 times, it is translated as prophesied prophesy. There's only two times that is translated as raved here and 1 Kings 18, 29, referring to the prophets of Baal. If you remember that story, the prophets of Baal raved and in that context, they cut themselves so the blood would flow and they began like chanting and doing all these dances, trying to arouse Baal to, to, to no end. And I think same thing here, but Saul's going to do far worse He's going to do far worse. Look at verse 10b to 11. Saul had a spear in his hand and Saul hurled the spear for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. You kind of wonder, why does he have a spear in his hand? I wonder, what did David think with every pluck of the string? You know, David's sitting there, he's playing his lyre, he's plucking the string and he looks over and he sees Saul and Saul's like just twirling his spear. Like, <laughs> what is David thinking like? We know what Saul's thinking. Saul thought, I will pin David to the wall. Saul intends to kill David. Saul is premeditating 
killing David. Not once, but twice. David evaded him twice. The man who was unwilling to put King Agag to death is now trying to put to death the future King David. Saul concludes that his jealousy and David cannot coexist. So rather than put to death his jealousy, he decides, I will put to death David. But David escapes. Why? Because the Lord was with him. And we'll stop right there with our exposition. Application. I have nine truths this morning. Nine truths. Number one, we need not just brothers and sisters in name, but close Christian friends in the fight. We need not just brothers and sisters in name, but close Christian friends in the fight. David's life is about to be forever changed. Right? At, at, at this moment, right here, this moment, his life is never going to be the same. His life is about to be changed. Over the next several chapters, we are going to see that Saul makes it his mission to kill David. He pours in all of his resources to seek out David and to put his life to death. There are going to be some real lows for David, some real lows. Periods of isolation, periods of depression, discouragement. There's going to be intense trials. And yet God in his mercy provides the grace that David needs through the friendship of Jonathan. We all need more than just brothers and sisters and name only. We won't make it in the fight if they are in name only. We need brothers and sisters, close, intimate, Christian friends who love us as their own soul. And we love them as our own soul. Do you have somebody like that in your life? Do you have somebody like that in your life? If you don't, go ask somebody. Humble yourself and say, will you be my friend? I need friendship. We won't make it in the fight. It's too hard. Two, humility is not only knowing, but fully embracing that all of our success, including others, is owing to the Lord. Humility is not only knowing, but fully embracing that all of our success, including others' success, is owing to to the Lord. One thing I'm struck by is the humility of Jonathan. If anybody perhaps could make a case for being angry at David's success, it was Jonathan. He had done nothing to deserve the rejection of his kingship. He was being punished for his father's sins. How easy it would have been for Jonathan to think, in steps this little shepherd boy who plays the liar. He got one lucky shot in with a giant. I, I, I mean, I could have done that too. That's not the perspective Jonathan has at all. Jonathan gives to David his robe, his armor, even his sword, his bow, and his belt. He gladly and humbly renounces all of his status symbols of being a prince. Why? Because he recognizes this is the Lord's doing. God did this. We never see Jonathan envious of David. 
We never get the impression that Jonathan ever thinks, what about me? What about my legacy? I mean, when, when my dad was anointed king, I had already, like, began making plans for my kingdom. Humility is not only knowing, but fully embracing that all of our success, including others' success, is owing to the Lord. Three, if the Lord is not enough, nothing will ever be enough. If the Lord is not enough, nothing will ever be enough. I was watching an interview with the actor Matt Damon. Um, some of you may know who he is, some of you may not. Um, he's an actor in Hollywood. Um, in the interview, he was being asked about how he felt the first time he won an Oscar. And he said, you know, they give you this little gold trophy for winning an Oscar. And Matt Damon said that night, the night that he won it, he went home, his wife went to bed, and he stayed up just looking at it. And he thought to himself, I'm glad I didn't mess anybody over to get this. He said, some people, you know, they wait their whole life to get this. And, and once they get it, they realize it's, it's not enough. And he said, I, I, real, I realize that if, you, if you're looking to this to fill the hole inside of you, then no matter what you get, it will never be filled. Now, Matt Damon's not even a Christian, and yet he is describing the gospel perfectly. Saul was chosen by God. He was God's anointed out of all the people on the planet. God chose him, one person, him and him alone, to lead the very people of God. And God was not enough for him. He needed something more. The only problem is, is that if the Lord is not enough, nothing will ever be enough. If our justification being made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ, if our adoption being grafted into the family of God, being made sons and daughters, if our redemption being forgiven of all of our sins, if our regeneration being made alive in Christ, if our sanctification being conformed to the image of Christ, if the hope of our glorification being together with Christ forever and ever, if those are not enough, nothing will ever be enough. If we think, you know, I, I, I just, I, I got Jesus, but I need Jesus plus marriage to be happy. Like I'm single and I, I've, got, I, I, I've got to be married to be happy. If we think, I, I, okay, I'm married now, I need kids. If we think we need Jesus plus kids to be happy. I, I will not be happy without kids. If we think, I, I need Jesus, but I need a COVID-free world. I'll be happy when COVID is done. If we think, I need Jesus plus a job. You know, once I get this job, I'll be happy. If, if we think, I need Jesus plus the approval and praise of man. Once I get that, once people recognize me, once my dad finally admits that I made it, then I'll be happy. Friend, no matter what you get, if that's what you think, it, I assure you it will not satisfy. It will not satisfy. How do I know that? Because Saul, Solomon, the rich young ruler are historical proof of this fact. All three were given the world and they weren't happy. They weren't satisfied. Four. The praise of man is like wood to a burning fire. You always have to keep adding it. The praise of man 
is like wood to a burning fire. You always have to keep adding it. We are given every indication that the people love Saul. Uh, you know, they said, there's no one like him in all of Israel. He met all of their standards. He was tall. He was handsome. He was, you know, all of the things that they were looking for. He, he rallied the troops. He was, he was a successful uh, military strategist. He was victorious in battle. We even see here that the women came out to greet King Saul. They didn't come out to greet David. They came out to greet Saul. They showed up for Saul. They say, Saul has struck down his thousands. You know what's tragically ironic? Is that if this song was one line instead of two lines, Saul probably would have been fine. Saul has struck down his thousands. Saul has struck down his thousands. Yeah, I did. But the praise of man is like wood to a burning fire. If we live for the praise of man, it is a fire that will always need to be fed. Always. Five. Comparison is like gasoline to a burning fire. Comparison is like gasoline to a burning fire. You know, one thing I have found is that if I'm comparing this fire inside of us to our sin or to our flesh that exists inside of us, that fire can slowly die. And, and it does. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the sanctification, the fire slowly dies. That's what sanctification is. That's what the work of the Holy Spirit is. That fire begins to die, die, die. And it, it can even like almost completely go out. It's like one little flicker. And then along comes someone. And their words are not just a piece of wood that keeps the fire burning, but their words are like gasoline to the fire. And the word that is written on this gas can is comparison. Comparison. How many times are we satisfied in the Lord? I mean, like genuinely satisfied in the Lord until someone makes a comparison. I cannot tell you how many times in my own life, like I have finished a sermon. I'm satisfied in the Lord to be doing his work. Like just, like just genuinely, genuinely satisfied in the Lord to be doing his work. And five minutes before I walk out the church door, someone tells me, Hey, uh, Pastor Matt, uh, I heard a wonderful sermon from church from such and such a pastor this past week on YouTube. And it just really blessed me and challenged me. How many times do I feel satisfied in the Lord that God is using me to make a difference in my boys' lives? Like, I'm genuinely satisfied. I look at them, and I'm like, look at, I mean, look at you guys. You guys are all sitting here listening. Like, like I'm so satisfied in the Lord. And then inevitably somebody says, man, so-and-so is such a good dad. I've learned so much just from watching him as a dad. Yeah, yeah, and then someone, yeah, he, oh man, he's such a good dad. Comparison is like gasoline to a burning fire. Six, jealousy and envy hinders our ability to love someone. Jealousy and envy hinders our ability to love someone. Do you remember what was said about Saul, how he felt towards David? 1 Samuel 16, 21, and Saul loved him greatly. Saul loved David greatly. And less than two chapters later, Saul is very angry. He's displeased and he's looking with suspicion from that day on at David. What happened? Saul was never able to return to a place of loving David. 
Envy works like a dam that kept love at bay from entering his heart. You ever struggle to be happy for someone? You ever struggle to be happy for someone? Maybe they got into a relationship when you have waited so patiently for one. Like you have prayed, you're like, Lord, I know I've prayed more than they have. I have waited for a, a significant other and, and, and they, they get one. They got the one I was hoping for too. Maybe they got into school. When you work twice as hard as them, they didn't even study. They were playing ping pong all the time. I never saw them studying. They got into school. I studied 10,000 times harder than them. Maybe they got praise for a project when it was really your idea. Boss comes in and says, Jolene, good job. And, uh, well, you don't have any fellow coworkers, but Eugene's like, that was my idea. I came up with that project. Jolene's is the one who handed it in. Maybe people always call them to hang out when you're always the one bending over backwards. Like, why, why do they always call the, them to hang out? Like, I, I'm always bending over backwards for my friends. But they always call. They don't call me. They call them. You ever struggle to be happy for someone? Jealousy and envy will hinder our ability to love one another. They will. Seven, jealousy and comparison enslave us to a bog that nobody can successfully wade through. Jealousy and envy enslave us to a bog that nobody can successfully wade through. Saul never could get this song out of his head. I imagine it played over and over and over again. It was just on repeat. The words enslaved him. They shackled him to a bog of jealousy and comparison that he never could wade through. You know what uh, much of social media is today? Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Pinterest. I don't even know what half of those are. Um, do you know what much of social media is today? It's a bog. It's a bog. Not all of it, not all of it. There is a lot of good that comes from social media. There is. But I find that more often than not, it's a breeding ground. It is a breeding ground. Breeding ground for what? A breeding ground for comparison. Jealousy. Envy. We stop looking to our maker for our worth and value. And we look to what others say or are doing or what level they're on or what they've achieved or what, who, who's, who's going out on Friday night or who, who's got the cutest house and who's got the most pets and who's got... Da-da, and it's, it's just comparison, 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 comparison. And you say, well, I don't even use social media. Don't, I don't use social media either. You're like, oh, whew, good. You can still find yourself wading through this bog. Even though I don't use, I still find myself wading through the bog. You can, you can find it on the basketball court, in the meeting room at work, at the restaurant, in the mom's group, the dad's group, in the small group. None of us are immune from the, the, the temptation to compare ourselves. Jealousy and comparison enslave us to a bog that nobody on their own can successfully wade through. Eight, jealousy and the desire for the praise of man left unchecked, unconfessed, unrepented of will kill us. Jealousy and the desire for the praise of man left unchecked, unconfessed, unrepented of will 
kill us. In Saul's case, it led him to attempting to kill David, but all it really did was slowly kill Saul. That's all that it really did. There seems to be a direct correlation between Saul's jealousy and his desire for the praise of man. And this harmful spirit that comes upon him, it spiritually just eats him alive. It turns him into a raving, murderous lunatic. Now, of course, of course, I don't think any of us are throwing spears at one another. But we might throw daggers with our words, our looks, our attitudes. James writes, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. James 3, 14 to 16. Jealousy and the desire for the praise of man left unchecked, unconfessed, unrepented of will kill us. And number nine, you might say, well, so what do we do, Pastor Matt? All of those have all been like negative points. I'm aware of that. Number nine, the way to defeat jealousy, comparison, and the desire for the praise of man is for our cup to be so full of Christ. There is no room for anything else. The way to defeat jealousy, comparison, and the desire for the praise of man is for our cup to be so full of Christ that there is no room for anything else. If you think of your life as a cup, And inside this cup is your flesh, is my flesh, the old man. And every time that someone makes a comparison, every time someone praises someone else and you envy that praise, or someone praises you and you want more of it, that fire starts to grow. It starts to grow. How do we keep it from getting out of hand, causing us to sin? By being so filled with the living water of the Holy Spirit. By being so filled with the living water of Jesus Christ that it douses the fire. It gives it no opportunity to grow. Even if someone comes and pours gasoline all over it, Our cup is so full of Christ that Satan can shoot all the flaming darts that he wants at it. And the satisfaction of Jesus Christ extinguishes them all. The way to defeat jealousy and comparison and the desire for the praise of man is for our cup to be so full full of Christ. There's no room for anything else. I'm fully satisfied. It's like sitting at your grandma's house and you know, you've had like seven helpings and you're like, Grandma, no! I cannot eat another bite! No matter how good the food is, no matter how much we may want to be praised, we're so full of Christ. There's no room for anything else. Let's pray.